Okay, we can go ahead and start. So welcome to everyone and good afternoon on the Zero Discrimination Day and a very warm uh, greetings and welcome to our distinguished speakers who I will introduce uh, as we go along. Our discussion today will be held in English and in French. So uh, I can remind our audience that you can uh, uh, profit from the simultaneous interpretation and already thanks in advance to our interpreters. Throughout the session, we also will be highlighting reflections from the audience. So please feel free to put your thoughts into our chat. Uh, there will be also a 25 minute uh, at the end where we have an open uh, discussion. My name is uh, Mark Angel. I'm a member of the European Parliament from Luxembourg. In the European Parliament, I'm the Vice Chair of the Employment and Social Affairs Committee, and I have the great honor to be the co-chair of the LGBTI Intergroup, an intergroup of 152 members, and I'm happy Maria Walsh and Katarina Rinsema are here. They are two of these members, and we are from five political groups, and we are the biggest intergroup in the Parliament, and we try to streamline LGBTI rights into all European uh, policies. I also was appointed by UNAIDS as a champion for the 1990-90 treatment targets in 2015, and this is why I uh, always love as a former AIDS activist to uh, continue working on this important uh, cause. And uh, the aim of today, uh, of this meeting, this parliamentary event, is to engage the European Union, but not the Union alone, but also the 27 member states in the global partnership uh, against all forms of HIV-related uh, stigma and discrimination. Um, today is a special day, uh, and we are in special times with the terrible war, Putin's war in Ukraine, and we're having uh, in the parliament now a session discussing this, and this is why Commissioner Helena Daly will join us a bit later. She's in the plenary now. But I want to, want to uh, recall uh, something very important, that the war is terrible for all Ukrainians, for all citizens, but it's even more terrible for the vulnerable population, the people who are at risk, namely LGBTI persons, uh, ethnic or religious minorities, children and older people. And in the context of HIV and diseases, we have to think that the people who flee the country, now the refugees, they have to get their life-saving medication, be it for diabetes, be it for HIV or other trans-specific uh, trans medication. So we call on the member states who are hosting the refugees from Ukraine to not forget to, be, to give them access to these life-saving uh, medications. And the third remark is we know that uh, human rights defenders and civil society are under attack. You know the laws in Russia, and there's a risk that also civil society activists are going to uh, suffer even more during this war than other citizens. So we stand with Ukrainians today, but we have to also to continue with our business here. And um, therefore, I'm very happy that today we, um, we will uh, celebrate everyone's li right to live a full and productive life in dignity and, in and free of discrimination. It's also the day today to commit to action and to end finally the inequalities and related discrimination surrounding health, um, gender, identity, sexuality, drug use, and sex work, to name just a few of them. And th these persist uh, worldwide, and we know that these are the problems that fuel the HIV and AIDS uh, uh, epidemic. Uh, it's also exciting to see uh, the momentum and the commitments building up today in the European Union to finally address, uh, to finally address um, the so-called invisible needs uh, that remain unfinished business in Europe and are so critical to curbing the HIV um, AIDS epidemic. Uh, to, this morning there was already a roundtable uh, organized by HIV outcomes and with French policymakers, and they highlighted really concrete actions to improve the quality of life of people living with AIDS. Central to these efforts today, uh, the, the theme of today, this year's uh, Zero Discrimination Day is we, that we need remove laws that harm and create laws that empower us. So this is what it is about uh, this year when we celebrate Zero Discrimination Days. There is too many laws that are harmful to many populations, and uh, we want to push countries worldwide to create really laws that empower. And we've seen in those countries and in the European Union, we have the laws that empower, that this is much makes lives of um, people living with HIV much more easier. 
We know that there's discriminatory laws around uh, the globe and, uh, and therefore people are treated differently when they want to act as health services, they're excluded uh, from health services and this restricts their lives and they're, they're excluded just because simply the, of who they are or of who they love or what they do and we cannot tolerate this and this is why we need a strong uh, uh, response to combat stigma and discrimination in the fight against HIV AIDS. HIV AIDS we need funds, of course, but we need also there's a human rights dimension to it, which is which is I think very 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 important. So um, it's very important that uh, today we call uh, for urgent action action against discriminatory laws, and we know that changing laws takes time. It's not always easy. We are here in a parliament, and we know that it's not always easy to change the laws. But this is the reason why uh, UNAIDS, UNDP. UN Women, the Global Fund, GNP Plus, convened the Global Partnership against uh, all forms of uh, HIV-related stigma and discrimination. And this fantastic initiative supports countries in building a coordinated intersectoral approach to ending um, the stigmatization and the discriminatory barriers uh, undermining the HIV uh, response. And in the European Parliament, we receive daily reports from community members uh, uh, about stigmatization and discrimination practices even in the European Union and uh, therefore I think it's also very much important to involve uh, the European Union and member states into this fight uh, and, and to act and to join the global partnership because we all imagine a world without AIDS and we imagine a Europe without AIDS and it's possible we know it's possible we have the possibility to end it by 2030 but we have to get back on track again and um, when i started to be an aids activist in the 1980s the slogan was silence is death and therefore we cannot be silent the next uh, nine eight years we have to be loud and speak up and uh, we need to act and this is what i my call today is let's not be silent and act through un aids i got into contact with the global partnership and um, I met fantastic people, the civil society actors, the people representing UN agencies, the Global Fund. And I realized, and I was shocked when I saw the map of the Global Partnership and I saw a huge blank. No European country, no European member state is member. The European Union is blank. Uh, the, even the neighboring states, our, our, our neighborhood countries and the countries who are potential candidates. And I think this cannot be, because I got even a bit upset about this, I thought, do we Europeans feel so superior? Does, do we think we have no discrimination and no stigmatization? And, and, and uh, therefore, it's, uh, it's really good that uh, we, we have to be on board. And let me tell you one thing. Guess who is member from the European countries in their global partnership? Ukraine, the country which is now under attack. So another reason uh, that we show also solidarity with Ukraine and not leave them the only country on that uh, in the global partnership from Europe but uh, be, be, uh, act uh, to, to, to become a member of that. So um, therefore, I'm very happy, happy to be hosting uh, this event. And uh, without further ado, I'm already talked too much. I will give the, the floor to Franz Fayot. Franz Fayot is a very, very good friend of mine. And we've been uh, combating fights in, in the Luxembourg Parliament together when I was a member of the Luxembourg Parliament and he was a member of the Luxembourg Parliament. He's now Minister of Economy and Minister of Development and um, Development and Cooperation and Humanitarian Affairs, and um, he uh, represents a, um, our country Luxembourg, which is a long-standing and reliable partner of UNAIDS. And we were supporting UNAIDS and the Global Fund and other. Uh, uh, many other associations, not only with funds, with money and, and logistical support, but also political support. And we really always push the human rights uh, dimension in the fight against HIV uh, AIDS. So, uh, dear Minister, can you please share with us how Luxembourg intends to contribute to the global partnership as a way to address societal inequalities underlying the AIDS pandemic? And would it be possible uh, to work with Luxembourg to mobilize and engage other EU member states for actions on stigma and discrimination, as well as supporting selected partner countries in creating uh, a really enabling environment? Franz, the floor is yours.
Well, I think thank you very much, uh, uh, Mark. I didn't. I hope you can hear me. Um, so let me start by uh, by thanking you for um, having me on this um, on this uh, panel for being um, um, able to speak to you on this uh, zero discrimination day. It is indeed a pleasure and uh, and an honor to be uh, with you. And um, Mark, uh, today is also it's not it's not only zero discrimination day. It's also I was told this morning World Compliment Day, first of March. So let me. Let me also start by thanking you for uh, having been such a great uh, UNAIDS ambassador um, of, um, of Luxembourg. And um, uh, as you know, we are working on, on, uh, on, on reconfirming you as, as uh, UNAIDS amb ambassador um, because I think you have been uh, doing a tremendous job. And you, you mentioned uh, our um, um, involvement or role as a country to get other con EU countries on board. And I think this is also um, a part where you come in once again as a, as a member of the European Parliament to push this advocacy to get, get on board of the uh, global partnership. Also, um, other European countries, uh, which of course involves awareness uh, raising, which it, uh, involves advocacy, and we count on you to help us in this, um, in this important task. As you know, um, as you well know, uh, human rights are uh, underpinning every aspect of um, Luxembourg's development cooperation strategy. I'm um, a strong believer that uh, if the world wants to achieve the SDGs by 2030 and indeed leave no one behind, we have to start uh, by guaranteeing the respect of human rights in all aspects of societal life. This is something we also uh, intend to do um, at, um, as a member of the Human Rights Council, uh, which uh, for the period 2022-2024, uh, where uh, we um, are committed to um, both on the international, and it goes without saying, of course, on the national stage to tackle all forms of discrimination to guarantee uh, the integrity of all human rights. Ensuring human rights calls for reducing stigma, creating legal environments and strengthening accountability mechanisms accessible to all members of society and in all areas of public life. And this, of course, applies to health as well. As a country, uh, we are strongly supporting UNHCR's choice of the inequality uh, lens uh, adopted by the new global AIDS uh, strategy in 2021 and to the new global commitments on achieving the 10-10-10 uh, targets by 2025 if we want to end HIV as a public health threat by 2030. Inequality, economic and social inequality is um, deeply corrosive. Uh, we are all aware of that, corrosive for all aspects uh, of a society. And the same goes for societal inequalities, which are also the corrosion that may, prevents um, an effective fight uh, of, um, of um, HIV uh, AIDS. It is very clear that stigma and discrimination creates the inequalities that uh, drive the progression of the, of the HIV uh, epidemic. This was also um, very much uh, discussed and appeared very clearly in the uh, debates we had uh, last year at uh, the uh, UN AIDS um, conference that took place in uh, Dakar, uh, Senegal in, um, uh, in the fall uh, of last year. It was uh, very evident in all the discussions of the, um, the partners uh, involved in this conference, that uh, this is a uh, an, an obvious that that this is definitely a given. So we know that we all know that the COVID nineteen pandemic uh, widened the inequalities within countries and between population groups. Key populations are at heightened risk of life threatening infections due to their marginalized status in society because of the discrimination and stigma they still uh, face. I think you are all aware uh, of, the, of the numbers 
but I will just mention this one of the 1.5 million new HIV infections in 2020 key populations and their sexual partners, marginalized populations accounted for 65% of HIV infections globally. The risk of acquiring HIV is incredibly high for marginalized people. So what do we do about this and what does Luxembourg intend uh, to do about it? Well, I think there are, there are um, different um, actions very concrete actions that we can take. We, um, I started out by mentioning one of them, which is advocacy at uh, European level, uh, pleading and discussing with uh, other European member countries to join uh, the effort, to join uh, the global partnership to, uh, and to make their voices heard uh, to end um, AIDS and to end the discriminations. So I think that is that is a, a first um, very clear uh, path. But the other path, and obviously this is a political action. I'm um, I'm uh, saying this as a as a trained lawyer. Uh, if you want to change a law, and if you want to en enact a law, you first have to create the political um, the pol political common ground to make this happen. Uh, and uh, this, of course. Uh, uh, supposes and um, a, 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 it supposes that there is a consensus, consensus, consensus on this, and if there is no consensus, then you need to first uh, build it. This requires, of course, again awareness raising. It also requires education on many of these issues, and this is something that we uh, are doing with our uh, partner countries, and that we are also. Um, uh, is very strongly pleading um, with uh, in our involvement uh, in the uh, international community. So um, I think one of them, one one of the very concrete actions here is also to um, discuss these questions during our political dialogues with uh, partner countries to dis discuss them frankly uh, and without um, a, a taboo, but also of course without being uh, patronizing but to uh, make uh, our voice heard on these points during uh, our political dialogues. We also, and that's, an, that's another point of action, we also support uh, the work of the global partnership and can only applaud its role in assisting countries in achieving the 10-10-10 target by removing laws that harm, create laws that um, empower. The global partnerships strategic approach and inclusive platform to manage the diverse human rights violations faced by people living with HIV and marginalized populations will be key to address counterproductive discriminatory practices. To end the AIDS pandemic, we have to ensure the integration and full participation in public life of people living with HIV and key populations, just like anyone else. People faced with stigma and discrimination need to rely on an impartial and transparent legal system which safeguards their rights as human beings, regardless of their marginalized position in society and regard regardless of their health status. Thank you. Is, is, is the minister frozen? Is it frozen now, the connection? Or Thank you very much, Franz. Um, I think there is a slight yeah. technical problem, but anyway, I would like to thank the minister uh, very much for, for his intervention and for really becoming, wanting Luxembourg to become a champion for this global partnership. You quite rightly said we need advocacy and we need awareness raising. We will do it here on our side in the European Parliament with my colleagues Maria Walsh and my colleague Katarina Rinsema. And you, Minister, you are in the Council, you meet your colleagues in the European Council, you can raise awareness over there and also on other international platforms. So thank you very much for having taken your time and for, for giving us uh, uh, the, the voice of Luxembourg, and I, I was happy to hear that uh, stigma and discrimination is uh, to fight the fight against stigma and discrimination is on your agenda. So I have good news for you because 
our dear Commissioner Helena Dali has uh, joined us now. And Helena Dali is the first ever Commissioner for Equality in the European Union. And she has done so much already to bring our European Union towards a union of, of equality. And um, she is a very courageous woman. She has, has a very excellent record as a minister in Malta. It's, not, uh, it's, it's also her merit that Malta now, when you see the ILGA list of uh, LGBTI-friendly countries, is number one in Europe. So uh, thank you very much uh, to Helena for this. And um, we still have a little technical problem here. You might have to wait one minute. Okay, I will turn the camera to her now, but I would like to ask a few questions to Helena Dali now. Helena, we have to improvise here. She came up to my office, uh, and uh, uh, so, um, so Commissioner Dali, can you tell us on, on, on how the European Union is moving towards this union of equality, which you are the architect of, and uh, what are your views on how the European Union can also support uh, partner countries in reducing these inequalities, fueling the HIV um, AIDS pandemic, and how do you see the possible roles of the global partnership in supporting your efforts and vice versa? And now we turn the camera towards Helena and uh, the floor is hers. Yes, hello, good afternoon. And, and uh, I apologize for, for, you know, we had this uh, um, urgent uh, parliamentary meeting on, on uh, the situation in Ukraine and so obviously I had to be there. I'm s I actually snuck out mm -hmm. of, of, of the of parliament and have to uh, go back soon. But how is the EU moving towards a union of equality? Um, the the um, EU is anchored uh, in values of equality, uh, human rights and non-discrimination and building a union of Quality is one of the key objectives of this uh, commission. So our mission is to deliver the EU's commitment to inclusion and equality and equality in all of its senses, irrespective of sex, racial or ethnic origin, age, disability, sexual orientation, religion, or or belief. So in 2020 and 2021. Um, the Commission delivered six strategic documents in the equality area, which, which guide our action, uh, namely the Gender Equality Strategy, the Gender Action Plan, uh, the Anti-Racism Action Plan, the Roma Strategic Framework, the LGBTIQ Equality Strategy, and the Disability Rights um, Strategy. So these strategies uh, comprise targeted initiatives um, such as uh, relating to pay transparency and gender-based violence as well as uh, cross-cutting methodologies such as equality mainstreaming which in simple term means the integration of the equality perspective in all EU policies and financial um, programs. A dedicated task force on equality was set up and work on equality is mainstreamed in, in all uh, DGs thanks to its uh, coordination. All these strategies have an international uh, dimension that uh, reflect a commitment for internal and external policy uh, harmonization. On your questions on, on the inequalities fueling the HIV AIDS um, pandemic. Um, as you know, around 785,000 people are living with HIV and require lifelong treatment within the EU. And of course, HIV AIDS is a serious condition and harms uh, the lives of many people around us. Uh, but aside from, from the uh, impact of the condition, it is uh, stigma and, and discrimination that, that hurt most. So this is because they constitute a major obstacle to seeking testing, accessing or staying on, on treatment, uh, as well as the ability to continue to live uh, socially as one did prior to, to the infection. So we, we can and, and must combat this, this stigma and we must speak up, collect evidence and share facts and, and knowledge. 
So I, I welcome this conference to mark the Zero Discrimination uh, Day as a vital part in, in counteracting HIV-related stigma. So in 2015, with the Sustainable Development Goals, world leaders made a global commitment to end the AIDS epidemic by 2030. So to get there, we must stop HIV-related uh, stigma and discrimination. So the Commission supports EU member states in, in this endeavor, and we champion this, uh, this goal at the international level. So we tackle HIV AIDS from different policy angles, including funding, research, prevention, education, and uh, linkage to care. So cutting down stigma and discrimination is a pillar of effective prevention. Um, with regards to the possible roles of the global partnership in, in supporting uh, our efforts, uh, the HIV infection represents a clear example of inequalities in access to healthcare between rich and poor countries. HIV AIDS is a treatable condition in most of the Western world, but still is a fully fledged disease in resource-limited resource countries. So fighting inequalities within and among countries will be key to ending the AIDS epidemic. Ending AIDS as a public health threat by 2030 remains within reach as many countries are progressive progressing rapidly against HIV, when evidence-informed strategies and human rights-based approaches are adopted. Still, bold political leadership is required to challenge and address the social injustices and inequalities that continue to make certain groups of people and entire communities highly vulnerable to HIV infection. This is particularly the case of girls and young women in sub-Saharan Africa, for instance. So equally urgent and transformative action is needed against discrimination based on HIV status. The EU is a long-standing supporter of the Global Fund to Fund AIDS, to fight AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria and is thereby supporting their work for in helping partner countries reduce inequalities and fueling HIV AIDS epidemic. This is done by working with and through youth organizations with people living with and affected by HIV AIDS, other civil society organizations and communities themselves. Through our bilateral health programs, we provide support through projects addressing the sexual and reproductive health needs of the population with particular focus on youth and women, similarly provided through our support to the United Nations Population Fund Supplies Partnership. The aim is also to ensure that LGBTIQ persons affected by HIV continue to have access to treatment and that they are not discriminated against in their access to basic services. Beyond fighting HIV AIDS, the ultimate goal is to tackle its root causes, promote sustainable growth through decent working conditions, social inclusion and fair wages, as well as targeted investments. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helena, for this uh, uh, wonderful uh, speech you gave us. Uh, you mentioned bold leadership is required. Well, you are you are already a good leader in this fight, and you are, you are, you, are, uh, you fight for this um, combat against the discrimination and stigma not only within the EU but also with your colleagues in the Commission in our external action. This is really good, and it's good. Uh, we we love your commitment to equality, to rights, to inclusion, and um, we we wish you a good hand in in the next two and a half years on this work. And uh, we know, I know personally that we can always count on you. It's always a pleasure having you with us. Thank you very much, Helena. So we come to our next speaker, which is Matthew Kavanagh, who is the uh, deputy executive director of UNAIDS. Uh, 
welcome Matthew with us here. Thank you for joining us. Um, I've already referred to the uh, a, a global aid strategy, which informed the 2021 political global aid strategy. Um, sorry, sorry, I'm getting, um, I have to say bye-bye to Helena, bye. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Matthew, for this. Um, no worries, so I, thank, thank you, Minister, for joining us and, and, and continue, please. Yeah, sorry. Um, so I've already mentioned all the fantastic work UNAIDS did. I will be short because you are the speaker here. I will just uh, ask you a, a few questions. Can you tell us what is unique about the new global aid strategy and how it's bold new approach approach is key to closing the gaps, preventing a progress towards ending AIDS. And how does the global partnership uh, fit into the organization uh, of the strategy, particularly to advance the society uh, enabler targets? So, and this Zero Discrimination Day in particular, UNAIDS is highlighting the urgent need to take action against discriminatory laws that result in certain groups being treated differently and being excluded. Um, can you explain us why such legal and policy reform is so much critical if you want to end uh, uh, AIDS by 2030? Matthew, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Mark. And, and uh, I'll, I'll try to take each of those questions in, in turn. But let me just start by thanking, thanking you for your leadership and, and thanking everyone who's joined on this Zero Discrimination Day for your commitment to ending the HIV-related discrimination and those intersecting inequalities that we know are driving the HIV uh, pandemic. Also, let me thank you, Mark, for reminding us about the ongoing crisis in Ukraine. You know, we're deeply concerned about the continuity of HIV treatment and prevention services and the safety of the brilliant AIDS activists and LGBTI activists and others in Ukraine who have really led the AIDS response. Our team in Ukraine is coordinating across the United Nations Global Fund and others to help blunt the impact of this crisis. We know it will fall disproportionately on those same communities that are affected by HIV. And so just thank you for raising that at the, at the start. So let me turn to the, the strategy. The core of the new global aid strategy is a realization that we've made incredible progress uh, against AIDS uh, in the recent years. You know, together we've saved millions of lives. During the last five-year strategy, we made a major leap. And, and you know, I'll, I'll acknowledge, Mark, your, your leadership in kind of championing the 1990s that really set a goal not just of getting drugs to people, not just of getting prevention technologies to people, but do so in ways that suppress the virus with high quality programs so that we could actually do that. You know, for many countries and many communities, that drove massive drops in deaths and new infections. But our success made even clearer how inequality is continuing to drive the HIV pandemic. You know, while some communities saw falling rates um, of HIV, people living at the intersection of criminalization, poverty, and marginalization still face high risk of HIV treatment in their daily lives and the high risk of death if they contract the virus. And so the new political declaration adopted by member states this June and the new global aid strategy, it sets out a bold vision, right? It says a couple of things. It says, we're going to judge our success by how quickly and effectively we close these gaps. The idea is that the smaller the gap between those who have and those who don't, the faster the pandemic ends. And we're gonna focus on those interventions, those elements, those activities that will reduce these inequalities. And at the center of this, as the, as the very, both ministers rightly said, is shifting the law, policy, and social environment in which the AIDS response is happening. You know, brilliant HIV prevention programs and cutting edge technology will not stop the virus if they don't reach those people who need the most in the ways they are best able to be treated and which those people are not actually subject to the massive discrimination and stigma that actually pushes people away from services and makes those services ineffective for them. We have these proven tools and approaches. What we need is the rights and the protections that actually get us where we need to go. This strategy has, as, as has been referenced, bold new 10, 10, 10 targets. And these for the first time address the law and society factors that are undermining the progress and causing the AIDS response to fail for the very people who are most vulnerable to HIV. These targets are set with the idea of a couple of things. One, reduce to less than 10% 
the portion of people living with HIV and affected by HIV who experience stigma and discrimination, reduced by 10 to below 10% of women and girls, particularly living with HIV and key populations that experience gender-based inequalities and violence. And the target, which is I think really remarkable in the new strategy is that less than 10% of countries have punitive laws and policies in place. You know, this is one of the first times where the world has really set concrete human rights goals. And we across the joint uh, joint UN program are very proud uh, that these have been set in this way. But we also know that this is incredibly hard work ahead to actually realize those. You know, the whole strategy is actually the hardest work is still ahead of us. Um, and that is something to keep in mind. These are, as has been said before, these are global targets. And I can report that today, no country in the world meets the 10, 10, 10 targets. So Marcus, you rightly put it, Europe is not absolved. North America is not absolved. Indeed, this is about every country needing to look inward at the change we need to make um, and stand in solidarity with people living with HIV, gay men and other men who have sex with men, sex workers, people who inject drugs, young women, others worldwide who need the attention and global solidarity. We estimate that if we address this violence and discriminatory laws, that the world would avert 2.5 million new infections and 1.7 million more AIDS-related deaths. That's the difference between doing these social enablers and not. We know it's possible and we've got the strategy to do it. So I wanna turn for a second to the global partnership to end stigma and discrimination in all its forms um, and the oper operationalization of the global AIDS strategy. Minister Fayo, Fayo, Fayo called stigma and discrimination deeply corrosive. And I think that's right. I think the point is that it harms us all, right? This is what's fueling the world's deadliest pandemic, right? And we thank, uh, thank the minister for joining us in Dakar where we saw renewed commitment to addressing these issues um, in West and Central Africa. Um, events taking place around the world today show the growing recognition that stigma and discrimination are major drivers of the AIDS pandemic. The global partnership is an effort to bring together the expertise and the commitments of key partners, including communities, including governments, to eliminate these discriminatory laws, practices across the, across the world. I'm so glad that Dr. Mandeep Daliwal is here to speak um, as one of the leaders in this work um, for, for the joint program about the kind of work that's happening across the world. We know, for example, that the global partnership right now is working to operationalize the strategy and to address all the targets in places like Benin and Burundi and the Central African Republic who are working on law reform and removal of punitive laws facing people living with HIV. A powerful new patient charter in the Central African Republic and a new law on stigma-free health services in Iran shows what's possible when political leadership happens. It also shows that there is leadership throughout all the world, even in deeply challenging contexts. Let me take the opportunity to just acknowledge the increasing number of partners joining the global partnership from around the world to especially commend the Global Fund for strengthening its catalytic funding for anti-stigma and discrimination work with the Bringing Down Barriers Initiative. The replenishment of the Global Fund is a critical intervention when it comes to um, how we actually drive this work forward. And let me similarly just be just delightedly welcome Luxembourg. Uh, thank you, Mark, for, for pushing here and, and having an EU country join the Global Partnership. Um, and thanks for your commitment to make these happen. Let me just conclude by saying that kind of on this, this Zero Discrimination Day, what we're talking about here, as you said, is really a focus on laws that in fact, laws and policies that are meant to protect people from harm. That's the point of a legal environment, especially when they're the most vulnerable and especially when they're most in need of help, not to harm them. But in many countries, for some communities, laws create and reinforce violence, marginalization and discrimination, simply because of their gender, their sexual orientation, their identity, their HIV status, their choice of work. These laws are discriminatory. They deny fundamental human rights and freedoms, and they undermine pandemic response by driving people away from the state and away from services. We've seen this in HIV. We've also seen this in COVID-19. So this is not a unique context. In pandemics, human rights are a key part of how we intervene to stop them. 
We've seen, we did an analysis of the last five-year strategy focused on the HIV testing and treatment goals. And we saw that countries that criminalize key populations, sex workers, men who have sex with men, people who use drugs, made significantly less progress overall at a population level on the 90-90-90 treatment targets. What this shows us, right, is that we have a population impact. It harms us all when we have punitive laws. And we know that countries are responding to this and showing leadership. Angola, for example, which has struggled with high HIV rates, has just moved to decriminalize LGBTI people and implemented non-discrimination laws instead. That is effective pandemic response. That's what we should be supporting around the world. And so thank you all for your leadership, for moving this ahead, and really eager for a kind of continued and growing partnership with the AU or the EU um, on how we uh, how we move uh, move forward on the, the global partnership. So thank you, Mark. Back over to you. Thank you very much, Matthew, for your passionate uh, 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 speech here. And uh, it's it's true, we have made so much progress, but we need now to end the inequalities to get the last step towards ending HIV AIDS. And uh, thank you also for recalling the 1010 targets and for naming the key populations. It's so important to always name them because it's if we don't tackle their problems, we will never uh, get reach our goals. So I come to our next speaker, which is my colleague from the European Parliament, Katarina Rinsema from the Netherlands, and she's very committed to to uh, to the LGBTIQ rights, and um, she is an active member of our intergroup. She's new, and I'm sure she will also be able to convince the Dutch her colleagues in the Dutch government and her colleague, who was a former MEP, Liesje Schreinemaker, who is now the development minister in the Netherlands since a few weeks, to join uh, Minister Fayot, uh, the Luxembourgish Benelux colleague, to really create maybe a Benelux initiative to push push and then I'm sure Maria will 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 contact the Irish government to join that coalition too. But Katrina, you are well aware that the HIV related discriminatory laws are still uh, are still really prevalent also in the European Union affecting people living with HIV and um, and, and vulnerable and marginalized groups such as the uh, LGBTI community. Um, let me ask you, what are some steps that the European Parliament could take to advance enabling legal environments at country level to reach those left behind in the HIV uh, uh, response? And within the European Parliament, uh, we treasure the voices and engagement of our constituencies. Can you speak to the partnership with community networks and civil society organizations as key actors for advancing this equality uh, agenda? Katarina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mark, and also thank you, Matthew, for a very passionate speech and also for the convening power of Mark that we're all together here in this community. I hope really in a post-COVID reality that we can actually be physically together because I think that will really also help the movement forward. Uh, let me first uh, start by saying I'm very happy to be invited over here as a new and fresh MEP from the Netherlands. And I think we all agree that this is an incredibly important topic uh, that we're discussing here today. Um, what can we do as parliaments? Well, personally, uh, I'm in constant touch with my colleagues in The Hague to find opportunities to address uh, the problem of the vulnerable groups. And indeed, I think that's important that there would be perhaps a Benelux initiative or, and I, I hope the Irish will join as well, because I do think it's very important that member states indeed show, uh, show up, stand up and show some courage. From a personal point of view, I would like to talk today about blood donation. And why do I choose this subject? Well, I'm a mother of a young child. He's born two and a half years ago. And uh, well, nobody of course expects um, giving birth to be a ride in the park, but I didn't expect um, to nearly lose my life was a very complicated uh, childbirth. And uh, the only reason I'm still here and talking to you today is because of blood donation. I received uh, four times uh, blood in uh, one week and it, uh, it saved my life. And uh, when I um, resigned out of the hospital, my uh, friends from the rainbow community told me, well, actually, do you know that we're not allowed to give blood? And I, did, I was not aware of that. And I was super shocked about it because I find that hugely uh, discriminating. So I think that um, we really have to stop this blood donation prohibition uh, because it results in clear discrimination and uh, exclusion of uh, men having sex with men. 
So I know that science, uh, science has developed, knowledge has developed, and I think it's super outdated uh, to think that there's a danger coming from the rainbow community to donate blood. So I think it would be kind of common sense to pre-check everyone uh, donating blood uh, on any serious disease. So in my country, in the Netherlands, we took just a very small step forward last year um, by uh, giving uh, bisexual and uh, gay men uh, under certain conditions the possibility of donating blood. And these certain conditions say uh, you have to be in a monogamous relationship. Well, that, I still find that bizarre because this doesn't apply to heterosexual persons. Uh, so yes, it is a small break breakthrough, but I do think that we have to tackle this form of discrimination uh, EU-wide. And the European Commission has held a public consultation on the revision of the blood uh, directive. They have been asking for input from uh, the, uh, the rainbow community, but I don't think it's enough. I really think that we as European Parliament, and I will do it myself because it really it saved my life, I will start uh, pushing for this. Uh, I do believe when it comes to blood donation that it doesn't matter with whom you have sex, but only whether the sex was safe. And this is where uh, the questions of medical profession should um, focus on. So yeah, this is where I'm starting. It's maybe a small step, but I, I really got appointed just uh, one month ago. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here. And as Mark said, I'm really, really uh, an activist by heart. So I will do everything in my power, this mandate to help our community and the rainbow community forward. Uh, please invite me, uh, send me documents, uh, relevant things that I should uh, know about. Uh, I serve uh, under the leadership of Prime Minister Mark Rutte. So this is the VVD, the current uh, Prime Minister in the Netherlands. He's been one of the longest serving Prime Ministers now in Europe. Um, we are a very liberal political party. Um, I am also a, a, a true liberal by heart. And um, as you can see, we stand, of course, today by uh, the people of Ukraine, but I'm uh, really a believer that um, there's a place for everyone here in Europe and in the world, uh, no matter um, the color of your skin or your sexuality. And when it comes specifically to blood donation, uh, please reach out to me to see how we can uh, push this forward. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Katerina, and uh, uh, also for raising the question of the blood donation. And as you said, the European Commission will review the, uh, the blood directive. There is a consultation ongoing, and maybe this could, the, uh, could be a first interaction of the LGBTI intergroup of the Parliament with the newly created last week. I forgot to tell that we created in the European Parliament a working group uh, uh, to combat and to fight HIV AIDS. And and there's doctors in it, there's members from, from uh, the human rights committees, there's members from the scientific committees, and I think this is a good mix also in, in that uh, working group, and together with the agitator group we can tackle that question, but also many other questions we are discussing today. Before coming to the next speaker, we'll have a little video played uh, for us, uh, and this video showcases the global partnerships, uh, hashtag more than. Uh, this is an anti-discrimination campaign highlighting what makes everyone more than their HIV status and more than any label that denies their individuality. Let's enjoy the video. Thank you. 
ตั้งแต่ช่วงแรกนั้นประเทศไทยมีเจตนาลมที่ชัดเจนว่าประชาชนที่มีเชื้อ HIV ไม่ควรจะถูกเลือกปฏิบัติไม่ว่าในสถานที่ใดเช่นตั้งแต่ช่วงแรกนั้นประเทศไทยมีเจตนาลมที่ชัดเจนว่าประชาชนที่มีเชื้อ HIV ไม่ควรถูกเลือกปฏิบัติไม่ว่าในสถานที่ใดเช่นสถานพยาบาลสถาบันการศึกษาหรือในสถานที่ทำงานโอเค I hope that you didn't have that those technical problems I had during this video but I uh, I I I am um, if if yes then I apologize for that but anyway now we come to the civil society civil society is such an important ally and partner in in our fight against HIV/AIDS and especially also when it comes to this human rights dimension of the fights against when uh, against HIV as we discussed today and I'm very happy to have Mr. Ferenc uh, Bagishinsky with us. Uh, he's a renowned human rights and HIV activist from Hungary and an executive coordinator, Action AIDS Europe and EU Civil Society Forum on HIV, tuberculosis, and viral hepatitis. Mr. Bagishinsky, I hope I don't mispronounce your name. Can you tell us about your hands on experience with HIV criminalization within the European Union and the effects of discriminatory laws and policies and inter sectional discrimination, particularly when it comes to accessing services and, and care. And uh, how are you able to leverage the EU Civil Society Forum to bring these human rights issues to the attention of the European Union? What else uh, needs to be done? And as you know, the Global Partnership is a joint government and community-led initiative. I like initiatives that provide win-win situations. So how can the Global Partnership help the EU Civil Society Forum and what can you contribute to it? Ferenc, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, many thanks for you, Anix, for the, for the invitation to speak here. I, first of all, I must apologize. I came down with an ugly cold this morning. So, if I'm not in my best, please bear with me. I'm, I'm trying to do my best today in this couple of minutes. Um, regarding your question on, on HIV criminalization, uh, unfortunately, we, we still experience it as an ongoing practice in, in most of the EU member states, although it is one of the examples of thing, uh, when, when something is going very wrong in the public health response. We not only know about HIV criminalization that uh, that these punitive laws are not the solution, but we also know that they further increase inequalities, discrimination, and they disproportionately affect those who are already experiencing multiple discrimination. It affects women, uh, people with migration background, people of color, who already experience um, this serious discrimination and inequalities and stigma in our societies. Um, when it comes to the European Union, there are still, and sometimes unfortunately, there are still uh, growing inequalities that are major barriers in the HIV response. They are barriers to accessing treatment, care, and prevention services. Um, 
just to uh, just to give some examples, there are harsh inequalities between the member states, uh, within member states and within the communities that we are working with. For instance, the reproductive rights of women in Poland or the sexual rights of LGBTQ people are under attack in a growing number of member states. I come from Hungary, the situation there uh, for the trans community or same-sex uh, partners have dramatically worsened in the past couple of years. And it is difficult to understand and accept that uh, there are these huge inequalities that also determine your access to services and care. What I experienced in Hungary um, compared to what I experience now, I live in Berlin, Germany. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a huge contrast. So um, it is, it is, it is a, a, a very sad reality that we have to, uh, there are these huge uh, inequalities between member states within the European Union. Also within the countries, there are inequalities. Just to, um, just to stay with the example of Germany, uh, we still do not provide HIV treatment for migrants in irregular situations. And we know that HIV treatment is a life-saving uh, treatment and also it works as, as prevention. So it is still not understandable why a country with uh, so much resources as Germany cannot, cannot provide HIV treatment for all, regardless of their um, um, legal status. And also within the, um, to go one level deeper, we can also see that there are inequalities within communities caused by multiple uh, discrimination, multiple stigma. For instance, um, a gay man with migration background or who engages in sex work or, or, or drug use have much worse level of access to services and treatment and care outcomes because of stigma at the, um, and intersectional discrimination at the, uh, the structural levels. Um, and very recently, it is so saddening that we hear concerning reports from the borders of Ukraine where refugees, people fleeing for their lives and leaving their homes behind, ex experience discrimination uh, based on their origin or ethnicity. This is very unacceptable and it's still happening on, on the borders of the European Union. Um, I think that the global aid strategy gives an excellent opportunity for the EU and its member states, together with the communities, to work towards ending these inequalities in the European Union as well, especially in relation to the 10 10 10 targets, which was uh, highlighted by previous speakers. But also, we need to close the gap between member states and communities when it comes to the treatment targets, the 95 95 targets. There are huge differences in accessing treatment and reaching the viral load undetectable viral load in, in between EU member states. Um, when it comes to the civil society forum, I can, uh, unfortunately, I have to say that um, shrinking spaces for civil society is also a reality in the European Union. So the CSF after was closed uh, down by the commission together with the think tank, which was the governmental advisory board. Luckily, we managed to uh, reorganize ourselves and keep the good working relationships with the commission. And the, and the agencies such as UNAIDS, WHO, ECDC, EMCDA, and so on. And one of our main tasks of the, of the CSF is to work as a watchdog in the HIV, TB, and viral hepatitis policies and responses. Uh, with our members at the national level, we are alerted about issues, what is going on at the national level in, this, uh, in these fields. And we can bring it to the European level. We can organize and support as much as possible with the, with the support of the agencies to reach the uh, decision makers uh, and sometimes put some uh, European pressure on, on, on uh, decision makers at the national level. And it also works the other way around. I think that uh, we monitor EU policies and, and some, sometimes our national partners can be very helpful in, in negotiating and talking to the local governments and, and making a change. Um, I think one just to give a very important uh, recent action that uh, we managed to have um, together with ECDC, which is the um, uh, epidemiology and, and control disease control agency, uh, to launch a joint stigma survey. This was the first one that done at the European level, and we really hope that it will be a very important tool in the future to uh, to measure and monitor changes in stigma against people living with HIV. Um, Regarding your question on what else needs to be done, uh, we need to make sure that civil society, both at the EU level, but also at the national level are acknowledged and properly funded because we are essential parties, partners, as, as you said, in your opening uh, in the HIV response. Um, and when it comes to your last question about the global partnership, um, 
I was very lucky to be there in Geneva when the global partnership became a reality. I was the Europe delegate uh, for the NGO delegation. I think it was in 2017 or 18, if I remember correctly. And I was very happy to see how it developed, how the co-conveners decided to have an intersectional approach to, to stigma and discrimination, and also how they cover all fields of life, because it is happening in all fields of life, unfortunately, still in the European Union. As I understand, Western countries of Europe and North America have not been an active participants uh, in the partnership, which, I, which is a shame, and I think it's also a lot of loss for our communities. Because besides sharing our good practices uh, with the world, we could also learn from them. There's so much to learn from other uh, regions, what is going on well in other parts of the world. Uh, and as the Civil Society Forum, we will, uh, we will encourage our members to engage with their governments, to join the partnership. Uh, and hopefully, we can, this way we can work better together on, on ending stigma and ending inequalities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ferenc. And what you told us is, is the proof that we have to get uh, European countries on board in the global partnership. You gave examples of Poland and Hungary, but also Germany when it comes to uh, discrimination against uh, HIV related discrimination against uh, refugees and, and asylum seekers and illegal uh, migrants. So this is very important and also for reminding us the, sh the shrinking um, space of civil society, we address that very often in many resolutions at the European Parliament. And uh, we know that civil society is not the enemy of politics, but it's the ally. And it's, as you said, together that we have to convince our governments and our uh, executives to join this uh, global uh, partnership. So thank you once again to you. And now we come to my dear friend, Maria Walsh. Maria Walsh is the co-chair, the vice president, sorry, of the LGBTI intergroup. She's a member of the European Parliament from, from Ireland. And uh, we all know in the Parliament that she's the champion on mental health. Uh, so um, uh, I would uh, give the floor immediately to, to, to Maria. I won't ask, put some questions. I, I would like just like Maria to tell us about the linkage, the parallels of, uh, of the fight against mental health. How is this linked to HIV and, and discrimination? And there is parallels, uh, uh, and also what can we as the European Parliament do to engage more closely with civil society and ensure that the input uh, rights and needs uh, that have to be addressed. Uh, Maria, I give you the floor, and we had we made you wait, but uh, it, it was difficult to get an order. It's uh, we are no, no. happy to have you I, on board. I, I, as well, thank you. <laughs> thank you very, very much, um, Mark. Uh, I'm super grateful. Actually, I was only delighted. Uh, first and foremost, I know in someone in your capacity as moderator in the, the multiple balancing of all things technology and the likes of commissioner running in uh, and needing uh, on a day like today where, uh, where an emergency plenary is, is, very, uh, is very demanding. Um, I just want to say from a, a virtual office in the west coast of Ireland, so the most west periphery of the European Union, um, as uh, Ireland's youngest MEP, as someone who didn't grow up in party oh politics um, and being involved in the European Parliament in this mandate, it being my first in the political landscape, um, and as a very proud LGBTQI woman, uh, and, and as your friend, Mark, uh, probably most important of all those, uh, I'm delighted to be here and I'm delighted to support um, today and, and all days where we are looking at the stigma and discrimination attached to another, uh, regardless of what it is, uh, what it is that they, uh, an individual comes with, um, is born with, um, has developed over their lifetime. I think it's incredibly important that we, uh, to the previous speakers, um, and our work in the, poli uh, in, in the policy area, uh, as well as organizers and activists just work together uh, more, uh, more strategically, uh, louder uh, and grander. Um, you're very kind in your words, Mark, on top, uh, on, and I'm so grateful to be able to discuss and look at mental health and well-being, particularly in the space of HIV and AIDS. Um, we often forget that we are all uh, born with mental health and well-being, I believe. 
Um, there's a number of different uh, pillars within the broad umbrella that is mental health uh, and well-being. One being mental well-being, the other being mental health. And then the third, in my eyes, mental ill health. And we all transition through it at various points. Um, what is incredibly difficult um, for some, particularly those uh, with HIV, um, is the fact that we have a horrendous stigma attached and, a just, and an instant discrimination of something we do not fundamentally understand unless you know someone with HIV, unless you've grown up with it yourself, or you're doing exactly what I've done in this past wee while, learn further about another than I have previously. Um, it's incredibly important that when we talk about um, and when we talk about HIV, when we talk about AIDS, that we also look at where we've been. Um, here in Ireland, we do not have a positive, uh, even currently, uh, 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 a legacy piece, uh, a historical element to um, the LGBTQI community and to those living with uh, HIV or, or AIDS. Um, that is something as a young uh, pro-European that I'm uh, I constantly look at and challenge myself within my work, as does my team. Um, for me, within the Parliament, and to your question, before I go on a, a on a <laughs> on a long on a long tangent, where I know there's time sensitivities here, um, we are creating and curating an EU year of mental health and well-being, uh, hoping to uh, have the President of the Commission assign that year in 2023, looking at the fact of what we're currently existing in, the EU year of youth, uh, the geopolitics of today, uh, and where we want to ultimately see the balance of our social and economic framework that makes up the EU. I think often we've forgotten over the years in the European bubble, it is not economics that drive change, it is the people. And if we do not have all people representing all groups, coming from all different backgrounds, uh, then we as a European Union do not move forth. Uh, and with that comes mental health, That with that comes mental health of all, um, particularly those uh, with HIV uh, uh, and or AIDS. Um, I think it's incredibly important we look at the difficulties uh, people with HIV face, uh, either getting support um, to talk, talk therapies, access to employment, which I know in your new role as uh uh, on the EMPL committee uh, that you will continue to fight for this mark, um, the stigma the stigma attached to it, and then uh, in comprehending with the stigma attached to mental health, which, which again, as we all have, um, a lot of work to do uh, to all previous speakers. I think ultimately how we signpost, how we uh, create a blueprint, how we create the support structure, how we talk about and ultimately educate not just ourselves, but our communities, is fundamental in how we bring about sustainable change, not just a quick speed. And it shouldn't be something that we just discuss one day a year. It needs to be discussed. It needs to be included in all our policies. Um, and I, I hope I answered some of your questions there. I know, uh, Mark, throughout the next uh, 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 minutes uh, of, of this discussion, you will also bring in the work of our LGBTI intergroup in the parliament. Um, and just to reiterate anybody who is connected or will watch this back, um, as Mark shared earlier, we are a broad church on, uh, on the intergroup. Um, we cover so many specific areas, me, uh, very much mental health and well-being. Um, and it is, it is rewarding to see, um, like it is today with our, 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 our voice of solidarity to our Ukrainian uh, brothers and sisters where we look at all community members and all that is attached uh, and all that is often in history where we've placed people in boxes. And that is a fundamental core of me learning today uh, and discussing mental health and wellbeing within uh, the, the, the community that has HIV uh, or AIDS. We have a lot of work to do, a lot of education pieces, a lot of intersectional work too within our committee work. Uh, but ultimately, um, we have a champion with Commissioner Daly, um, a phenomenal woman, not the same political grouping as myself, but 
I, I, I often feel when I speak to her, she never looks at, uh, at a party uh, or an accent or a national member state where a person's coming from. She's looking at the cause and how best to impact and help as many as she can. So with that, Mark, thank you very much. I hope I covered a little bit uh, uh, about the impact uh, of mental health on our communities, uh, particularly those with, with HIV uh, and, and AIDS and uh, sharing and sending love from, as I said earlier, the most West periphery of the European Union to all today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria, for, for being here and also for reminding us uh, uh, the importance of uh, mental health. And mental health and HIV AIDS have something in common. They are curable. They, we, we have medication and we need to provide access uh, uh, to, to treatment and uh, no discrimination within this access. So our fight is common. And it's also good that you reminded us that we have a common cause and we don't care about our political parties. We fight together to end uh, stigma and discrimination when it comes to access uh, to health care. I would like to also thank Julia Delamo from the Spanish Ministry of Health. She's joined us and she explained us in the chat all the efforts that the Spanish government has done in the last years to, to move forward uh, the agenda we're discussing today. Thank you very much for joining us. And now I would like to come to our last speaker, but we put her last for a special reason because I wanted Dr. Mandeep Dariwal, who is the director of the HIV Health and Development Group at the at UNDP, and she's here representing the Global Partnerships co convener and I put her last because I wanted to have her react to what she heard today. And I hope this was music to your ears, what you've heard from the commissioner, uh, from a European commissioner, from one of the ministers of the member states, from MEPs, from civil society, from Matthew, from all, uh, all the people who intervened. I hope this, is, uh, uh, hope this is music to your ears, as I said. And how can we make the global partnership a truly global partnership? And what opportunities do you see uh, for achieving the 10-10-10 targets? And this whole societal enabler, uh, all this discussion we had, I think is very important. And uh, I hope that uh, all the contributions we've heard will make you happy and uh, will, will, will give more impetus to the global partnership in their fantastic work they are doing. So, uh, Dr. Mandeep Daliwal, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mark, and um, thank you to the commissioner, the minister, the MEPs and the panelists and for everyone joining us online. It's an honor to connect with you today um, on Zero Discrimination Day. Um, I have to say, Mark, it is music to my ears, but what will make me really happy is transforming this music to something that helps us achieve and drive faster progress towards the 10, 10, 10 targets. So I really wanna focus on, um, I think, some concrete um, steps and actions that I think are vital. Um, we, heard from, we heard from Matt that we have a unique and perhaps historic opportunity presented by the 10, 10, 10 targets. Um, many of us have worked on human rights and law related to HIV for a long time, since the 1980s. Um, and it is indeed historic and unique to see these specific targets, um, uh, the 10, 10, 10 targets relating to, to law reform. And it's critical that we have these if we want to accelerate efforts to reduce stigma and discrimination. But our task is, is significant. Um, no country is on track to reach the 10, 10, 10 targets. Um, with, there's some progress, um, elements of progress in many countries, uh, but not on track to reach the 10, 10, 10 targets. And it's helpful to remind ourselves that we are in March, 2022, and these targets take us to 2025, and time moves quickly these days. Um, we have the evidence, which Matt also mentioned, that countries that have legal environments that advance non-discrimination, independent human rights institutions, um, effective gender-based violence responses have fared much better in their HIV responses than countries that advance punitive laws. So, you know, we have the evidence and we've had lots of scientific evidence on the prevention benefits of decriminalization for men who have sex with men, for transgender people, for people who use drugs, for sex workers, um, we now have to turn that evidence into action. So the Global Partnership is really working to strengthen synergies with existing human rights programs, including the work that UNDP has been leading on strengthening, enabling, and legal 
enabling legal and policy environments, um, the Global Fund Breaking Down Barriers Initiative, the implementation of the innovative GNP stigma index. Um, so all of these are, it's important to connect to all of these, but we must increase investment in human rights programs, especially on addressing criminalization. It's critical to achieving the 10, 10, 10 targets. And you heard from Matt the impact of uh, the investment in social societal enablers that's needed to avert by 2025, 1.7 million AIDS-related deaths, and 2.5 million new infections. I can't think of a better return on investment than investing in removing punitive and discriminatory laws and ending overly broad criminalization and criminalization of key populations. We know at the same time this challenge, even though there's good return on investment, it's a big challenge because we are going to see tightening fiscal space because of COVID um, and, and also what's happening in Ukraine. Um, and we know even before this, the international funding for HIV was declining, domestic funding was plateauing. So we have to be very smart and strategic and concrete about leveraging and connecting with investments in human rights programming um, through uh, the US president emergency plan for uh, uh, AIDS relief, as well as the global fund resources um, and broader human rights initiatives from the European Union and other multilateral and bilateral partners. Um, and many speakers today spoke about the importance of civil society engagement and protecting civic space. We will not achieve the 10-10 targets, 10, 10, 10 targets without strengthening civil society engagement and protecting civic space. The Global Partnership is a civil society-led initiative. This is one of its strengths. We also know that we have a global AIDS response today in large part due to the leadership of people living with HIV LGBTI people, sex workers, people who use drugs and their allies. What better way to pay tribute than to, help, to support them, to work with them so that we can together achieve the 10, 10, 10 targets. Unfortunately, again, we have challenges. We see a shrinking civic space, which has accelerated during COVID. A UNDP and ICNL report found that between January 2020 and 2021, a total of 143 countries enacted laws affecting the freedom of assembly in 56 countries affecting freedom of expression. This has an impact on our, on our partnership and on the work that we do at the country and community level. Governments, the UN and development partners have an important role to play in protecting civic space and supporting platforms for greater and more meaningful civil society engagement in HIV responses and efforts to achieve the 10, 10, 10 targets and especially the removal of punitive and discriminatory laws and, and ending criminalization. Uh, so what's needed? We have challenges, but we've had challenges all along. In the face of these challenges, we need bold action to scale the kinds of innovative policies and practices that are out there to remove punitive and discriminatory laws, including criminalization. This is what we need to drive progress on the 10, 10, 10 targets. Some of the 29 global partnership countries are already translating commitments into action. Iran recently passed an HIV anti-discrimination anti bylaw and integrated anti-stigma and discrimination efforts into its national HIV surveillance system. Kazakhstan established a website for real-time documentation of human rights abuses against people living with HIV and other key populations. UNDP is working with government, civil society, UN, and other partners in 90 countries to implement such innovative measures, um, including multi-stakeholder legal environment assessments, which have led to multi-sectoral multi action for positive legal and policy change, guidance for prosecutors on HIV-related criminal cases, community-led access to justice programs, and working with judiciary, legislators, law enforcement, and healthcare workers on reducing stigma and discrimination. Such efforts have contributed to increasing access to legal services for people living with HIV in Sudan. As a result of the legal environment assessment in Moldova, women living with HIV will be able to adopt children and have in vitro fertilization. In Zimbabwe, UNDP, UNAIDS Secretariat, UN Women, and ILO support work with parliamentarians on HIV criminalization, sexual offense provisions in the criminal code, and women's health. 
There have been successful efforts to reform laws. We've heard many examples today from laws that decriminalize adult consensual same-sex conduct, for example, in Angola, Botswana, or India to, to decriminalizing HIV transmission in Colombia. These are lessons on strategies in these processes that, that have contributed to positive law reform. These are critical to achieving the 10-10-10 targets. At the same time, we also see that such progress can be fragile. Lessons from UNDP's independent evaluation of the Global Commission on HIV and the Law, which we convened on behalf of the joint program, include the importance of sustained dialogue between those who make and enforce the law and those affected by the law, and a shared understanding of the harms caused by unjust criminal laws, which is key to making changes to ensure that we create an enabling environment in which stigma and discrimination are not barriers to HIV responses. So on behalf of the co-conveners for the Global Partnership, I wish to welcome Luxembourg's announcement about joining the Global Partnership. We encourage other EU member countries to join the partnership. And with all the co-conveners, we will continue to play an important role in applying, sharing, and amplifying evidence and practice to support countries and communities to end HIV-related stigma and discrimination and the unjust criminalization that for too long has impeded effective HIV responses. So a big thank you to everybody. And just to say how much of an honor it has been here, it has been to listen to everybody today. Um, and I'm looking forward to the exchange online. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much, Mandeep. And thank you for recalling that uh, the words we heard needs to be translated into action and that uh, many action has have been done. There have been a lot of successes and good examples, uh, good lessons others can learn from. Thank you for, for, for this important uh, contribution. I see we have 10 minutes time for, for a little discussion and I see two raised hands. I see the raised hands of Ralph Jorgens, who is the senior human rights coordinator of the Global Fund. And then there was another one, up, but we give the floor first to uh, Ralph. The name Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. Yeah. I will turn my video off because uh, my internet connection is not stable, but it's a great honor to be here with you today. And thanks so much for all your interventions. Thanks to you, Mark, and to all the other members of parliament for your leadership. And thanks in particular to the European Union for the great support uh, of the Global Fund. Uh, as many of you know, under the glo current Global Fund strategy, we have vastly scaled up programs to reduce stigma and discrimination. Um, we have in 20 countries of our Breaking Down Barriers Initiative, increased investments in programs to reduce stigma and discrimination more than tenfold from about 10 million to now over $130 million going to programs to reduce stigma and discrimination and increase access to justice in the 20 countries that are part of the uh, Breaking Down Barriers Initiative. Uh, Mandeep just referred to the need for greater investment and that need persists and the Global Fund is very committed under its new strategy, which has an even greater focus on stigma and discrimination and criminalization on gender inequality and on equity than the current strategy to continue to scale up our programming to reduce stigma and discrimination and to fight the harmful laws and policies that many of you have referred to, particular criminalization of key populations. The new Global Fund strategy closely mirrors the Global AIDS strategy, and uh, that recognizes that we want to work in full alignment with the Global AIDS strategy. As a co-convener of the um, global partnership, we are committed in particular to continue to scaling up programming to reduce stigma and discrimination in global partnership countries to, as, a, as an active member of the global partnership, to get other countries that are part of the, uh, the Breaking Down Barriers Initiative of the Global Fund and who are not yet members of the global partnership to also join the global partnership so that we 
combine our forces and work in collaboration. As Mandeep and others have said, we have a unique opportunity to work together. Uh, this is indeed uh, a unique opportunity and we can't miss on that. We will also have a much greater focus on criminalization and other harmful laws and policies. We're fully committed in particular to fund community-led efforts, efforts by communities of people uh, from the key populations, by people living with HIV to fight harmful laws and policies. So thanks again for this great uh, session today and for your engagement and for your support of the Global Fund. And we're fully committed to continuing to work with you. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Ralph. This renewed commitment is, is music to the ears of all of us uh, today. Uh, we have another uh, hand raised, and it's uh, Apostolos Kal Kalogiannis. Apostolos, you have the floor. Be brief, because we only have four minutes left. The floor is yours. Uh, excuse me, the hand was raised by mistake. Okay, but anyway, it was... Uh, it was nice that you stayed with us or, or during the whole uh, during the whole um, meeting. I would like to thank first of all everybody who was on board. I hope uh, that uh, the reason why I organized this uh, was clear, and I think we we achieved some commitments. I was very happy to have uh, the commitment of uh, Minister Franz Fayot from Luxembourg that he will be an ally. That we have the Commissioner recalling us what the European Union can do, the European Commission, my colleagues from the European Parliament, uh, uh, Maria Walsh and Katarina Rinsema. It was good to have also some of the co-conveners co of the Global Partnership on board. Uh, UNAIDS, Matthew, thank you very much for you. Um, and also uh, uh, UNDP and uh, also the civil society representatives. Uh, Today, we committed to action to end the inequalities of, and, and uh, this is very important. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy also that we are in line with a lot of things we do. We're in line with the global aid strategy. We're in, in, in line with what the global partnership wants. And I think uh, this is a good start to continue working on empowering the global partnership. It's such a wonderful initiative and um, we need to reach these 10, 10, 10 targets. I think it was who said it, Matthew, or who said it, it's only three years which is left and time is running very fast. So there's no moment to lose. And everywhere where we were, if we're in parliaments, if we are civil society actors, if we are in an UN, a UN agency or wherever we are, we have to we have to take this subject seriously and fight stigma and uh, discrimination when it comes to um, uh, access to treatment for HIV uh, treatment, but also for all other uh, medical treatments. This is also important in COVID times. There is a lot of inequalities there too. This is another subject where we could spend discussing hours about, but this is also a subject that the European Parliament takes very seriously. So thank you very much once again. Thank you very much also to Jantine Jacobi from the UNAIDS Brussels office and her colleague Celia and her whole team. Thank you also to, um, to the team in Geneva who has have done a fantastic fantastic uh, uh, works. It's uh, um, all these colleagues who had prepared this meeting with a lot of, lot of, a uh, lot of uh, uh, work. It's Simona and Isabella. Uh, thank you to you. And um, having said that, I hope to see you soon next time in a real meeting where we can chat afterwards and have a drink afterwards, because also that is what is a bit, a bit missing now during this uh, times where we only have virtual meetings. Bye bye. Have a good afternoon and uh, have a good uh, zero discrimination day. Bye. Thank you.